the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. He gives you the purpose for this book. He says, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, that is discernment and direction to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do come to you today in the name of Jesus And we ask you, Lord, that you would help us. We need you to give us enlightenment and understanding. Lord, open up our minds, our hearts. Uh, God, to receive your truth. So often we have heard, Lord, from the enemies uh, of the gospel, those that are contrary to you. And, uh, Lord, we have even learned some things that are wrong and untrue. And so we ask you that you would be merciful to us today and that you'd help us, Lord, bring understanding to our minds and to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to have a, a better understanding about what the fear of the Lord is and, Lord, how that relates to the beginning of knowledge. So speak to us today and help me, Lord, to be able to communicate your word in such a way that your children, your sheep would be fed and they would be helped. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, last Sunday, <clears throat> I introduced the topic to you, or the subject, the fear of the Lord. And I said we just want to kind of uh, look into that. And, and, and I want you, if you would, uh, <clears throat> maybe even uh, as a personal Bible study in your own time at your house to really ponder What does it mean? If God has told me that I need to fear the Lord, what kind of response uh, should I have to that? How should I live if the one who made me said, fear the Lord? And we tried to define that word fear for you. And and the reason I want to do that is because I'm afraid what we've done is we have kind of lessened the weight of that word. We made it just kind of respecting your father. But we're not talking about just an earthly father's respect and deserved respect. We're talking about the only being that is God. Coming into the presence of God. If God were to reveal just a portion of his glory this morning, you know what we'd be doing? We wouldn't be jumping the pews. We'd be flat on our face. We'd be humble at the sense of the weight of the holiness of the majesty of His presence. It would be a it would be a fearful thing to come into the presence of the deity, the being that is God. Amen. And and so what I'm afraid that we've done is we have taken Him from this high and lofty position. And we brought him so far down, right, that we refer to him now as the man upstairs. Right? And sometimes when people do that, we kind of like, okay, I understand that, the man upstairs. We're not thinking about a building, we're thinking about God, you know. He, but he is far beyond even that kind of statement of maybe somewhat people would think respect. Amen? Uh, to come into his presence. And I tried to illustrate this by the 
Niagara Falls. And some of you raised your hand and said, we, we've been there. I haven't been there personally. Maybe me and Brenda will make a special trip up there to go see it. But uh, <coughs> I hear that it's an amazing, powerful sight. Thousands and thousands of gallons of water plunging off a cliff. And, and just the, the, the force of that, just the, just the presence of that is an awe-inspiring sight. And it's such an awful sight, such a fearful sight, no one would dare to jump in and just swim around the edge, would you? You'd say it not. <laughs> and if, if by accident you were bumped in or tripped in, what would you be doing? I'd be scratching for every rock or whatever I could get a hold of. You know, I would, I would be consumed with the uh, fact that maybe in a moment I'm falling over this fearful thing. I wouldn't be out there just kind of backstroking, right? <laughs> when you think about the fear of God, it has to have that element in it. That, that this, is, this being is far beyond our comprehension. He is pure, pure holiness. In fact, when Isaiah described the, the, the seeing the Lord, Yahweh, high and upon his throne. He said in the uh, year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up upon his throne. And his train filled the temples. And it shook the building at the presence of God. And he said, and I saw the angels with, with two wings, they covered their feet. With two wings, they covered their eyes. This is, these are angelic beings that are created to be in the presence of God and to worship Him, but in His presence they even cover their feet and their eyes. They are, uh, they are so awed by the presence of God that they're saying over and over, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. I'm saying the weight of that, we've lost that. The weight of that. We think that we could just run into the holiest of holies, yeah. right? And stretch out a picnic table and have a good time in there. No. <laughs> we weren't even allowed in there until Christ rent the temple in twain and He gave us access to the presence of God. Amen? When Belshazzar, the king of uh, Babylon, he decided we're going to have a party, a, 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 a national party for government leaders. And they were drinking, having themselves a ball, what they would consider a good time. And Belshazzar said, let me just raise the stakes a little bit. Let's get the temples that were from, <coughs> uh, uh, the items out of the temple from Jerusalem, and we'll pour wine in those items that were from God's house in Jerusalem, and we'll drink out of those vessels. And he was just trying to go as far as he could go in debauchery. Nobody's as big as I am. Nobody's as powerful as I am. There's no God that's even more powerful than me, Belshazzar was thinking and saying, perhaps in his heart. And so... He saw immediately on the wall the fingers of a man's hand and they, write, they wrote out on that wall his doom. They said, you've been weighed in the balance and you've been found wanting and your kingdom is coming to an end. And you know what the Bible says about this boastful king who was ruling the universe at that time? It said, and his knees smoked together. When he saw that declaration from deity, his knees started knocking with fear of what God was announcing upon him. And we have story after story in the Bible of men coming into the presence of God and they're not coming in there chewing bubble gum. Amen? Amen? And so when you think about the fear of God, the Old Testament word for fear it's sometimes translated in the English, it means terrified. And, and I know He's our loving Heavenly Father that sent the Son into the world to save us from our sins. 
And I would not want you to lose that aspect of His love for us, but neither do I want you to lose that aspect of His holiness either. He is altogether holy. And He deserves our worship, adoration, and praise, right? Well, let's get to the text, the, the object of our fear. And that's, that's what we've been kind of trying to relate to you already this morning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if we're going to have truth, if we're going to understand things rightly, if we're not going to be blinded or deceived or live in this world in an imaginary state, the place that that begins at is with a proper reverence and awe and fear of the eternal God. Real knowledge, real wisdom, real truth comes from that first acknowledgement that God is and he must be listened to. He must be obeyed. He must be honored. If you don't start there, then you're going to end up not with true knowledge, but you're going to end up with foolishness. That's absolutely true. And so the object of our fear is the Lord. And if you'll notice in your Bibles... When you come across that word, a lot of times it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And when you see that, it is the word Yahweh. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the true God, not some false God that man has made up in their own minds, but the, the fear of the one and only God Yahweh. And that's important because of who Yahweh is. You see, Yahweh is the source of all knowledge because He is all knowing. <laughs> Did you hear that? He is the source of all knowledge because Yahweh is all knowing. <laughs> he, is the, he is our God who has created us and He is the God that knows all things. There's nothing that God does not know. He knows all things. Amen? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 146, or 47, verse 4, He telleth the number of the stars. Do you know how many stars are out there in the heavens, the galaxies? God says, I'll tell you the number, and not only can I tell you the number, but listen to what it says. He calleth them all by their name. Not only has he numbered all the stars, which is impossible for man, but he said, I've given each one a name. He's all-knowing. In Matthew chapter 10, he said, I know the number of hairs that are on your head. He's not just saying that to say, I want to impress you. He says, I know every small detail about your life. And it's not just you. It's every single person that's ever lived on the face of the earth. I'm saying the God that can give us true wisdom and knowledge is the God that already knows everything there is to know. There's no truth, no fact, no nothing that's ever going to come up before God that He has to say, you know what, I had not even thought about that. Right? Now think about this. We have a lot of opinions of men, right? Men. But can we all be honest? If man tells you something about eternal things, what we're, if we're not coming to you telling it from the Word of God, guess what we're all doing? We're all just taking a wild guess. Have you ever talked to someone about death? And you ask the question to someone about death, and you say, well, what's going to happen to you when you die? And I'm sure some of you have heard this comment in response to that. Well, you're just like a dog. I mean, they put you on the ground, you're buried, and that's the end of it. Now, can I say something to you? That is not... Wisdom. That's not knowledge. That is insanity. 
That is willful ignorance. That is foolishness. Because even in your own heart, you know that you're going to go somewhere after this world. There's a, there's a natural sense of that. Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in our hearts. We know that there's something after this life. And we, we have evidence of that too, right? We don't need evidence of that because God told us that, but we do have evidence of that. You say, preacher, what's the evidence? You go to anywhere in the world... The, the, the deepest, darkest point in Africa, like people like to say, people just has never been reached before, and guess what they'll have out there? They'll have little images and idols that they're worshiping and bowing down to. They're thinking about what's going to happen to them after they leave this world. In Egypt, what did they do with their pharaohs? <coughs> they built extreme places of burial, Right? And then they prepared them for what? And then they put in their coffins what? Gold and silver. And they said, here, you, you know, you need some the stuff on the other side. How insane is that? But they knew, right? Something is after this. There has to be something more than this life. But taking a wild guess about that topic is insanity. I mean, how many of you want to leap off into eternity with just a, I think it might be this way? Right? That would be like me jumping off into the uh, Niagara Falls place saying, I think I'll just fly off on the other side. I'll be fine. I won't get hurt at all. And so who are we talking about? We're talking about the God that made all things. And by the way, when you start thinking about... Uh, how God has created this world, the fine-tuning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe. If we were a little bit closer to the sun, it would melt us. We couldn't survive. If we were a little bit further away, we'd all freeze to death. We couldn't survive. We have to be right where we're at to live on planet Earth. Friends, that does not happen by a catastrophic accident. Amen? And it's not just that. There are numbers everywhere. Billions of, 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 of information, knowledge, streaming everywhere. That knowledge has to come from someone who knows. Isn't that true? And so we're talking about the God who knows all things, and we're talking about the, uh, the God that has all power. He is the living Creator. He is the being that exists outside. He doesn't need anything to exist. He's self-existing. Yahweh, the Lord, means the self-existing one. He doesn't need anything to maintain His existence. He, he doesn't need time or space or material to exist. Isn't that true? Yeah. Think about that. Before he made the world, he lived outside of time. He's not even governed by time. He's eternal. And that's hard for us to comprehend, but that's who knowledge flows from. That's who we are to worship. That's the only reason we exist. Remember Paul said in Acts chapter 17, your own poet say this, in him we live and move and have our being, we exist. We exist because He is. That's the only reason we are is because God is. But listen to me. When we were not, God was. Before man was made, before angels were created, God was, is, and will forever be. He's eternal. You say, what does that have to do with knowledge? That means that being eternal, he knows everything that, that, that did happen, that will happen. That's why he can speak words of prophecy about the coming of the Messiah and tell you exactly where Messiah would be born in a little town called Bethlehem. Amen? That's why he can prophesy of his death in Isaiah 53, and you can read about it 
uh, hundreds of years, almost a thousand years later in Matthew 27, and you read those two passages and you say they're almost identical. God sent His Son into the world because all we like sheep have gone astray and He's laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 22. He can prophesy the events that have not happened already because He already knows them. Amen? He's eternal. He's not limited by space or time. He does not need food or water or oxygen to live. Right? That's why Jesus said this, no man takes my life. I have to lay it down. He said, I lay it down and I'll take it up again. But how in the world are you going to kill God? Right? You can't because He exists all by Himself and He needs nothing to maintain His existence. And we know also that He's all-powerful. He's unchangeable, right? He is eternal. So when you think about that, you think then the obvious reality of fearing the Lord, and it becomes an obvious reality. The only way that I'm going to have any true, real knowledge is then to fear this one that has made us all. If you think about it in the world today, there are two main streams of of, of philosophies or world views mainly in our day right there is that God has made man or there's this view an evolutionary view that somewhere back then we don't know exactly when or where uh, something exploded we don't know what that was that exploded uh, and then from that explosion all these galaxies became to be now, did I fairly, kind of fairly sum up their view of the Big Bang Theory? If you look in science books, they'll tell you uh, <coughs> there was like this little dot, and almost the size of a dot at the end of a sentence, and then it exploded. And then everything come from that explosion. Gravity, oxygen, all the gases, I mean, <laughs> everything you need to live on planet Earth, it just came to be out of that tiny little dot. Right? So God made man, the one who's all-knowing, who knows everything, or a cosmic accident made man, and in that view, or what some call world view, let me ask you something, where does knowledge come in that world view? There's no informer there, is it? There's no instructor there. There's no designer there. Everything that happens from that supposed Big Bang moment, right, has to be accident after accident after accident after accident until there's enough accidents that all of a sudden you and I are walking around communicating and doing quite well in the world. Right? Right? And that's why you have views about what truth is. I remember years, years ago, Brenda came to me. We homeschooled Brenda. I say we homeschooled. Brenda homeschooled her children. For some reason, I didn't have the patience uh, to homeschool. I remember one time trying to help one of my children. I wouldn't call them by name because they don't like it when I point them out by name. And I was going over a simple math problem. And I thought, that, you should have that by now. I, come on! How many times have I got to show it to you? But they weren't understanding it. So Brenda's the one that taught them. And she came to me and she said, you'll never uh, guess what they're doing in California. I said, what? She said, they're a adding a curriculum where no answer is wrong. Remember when you shared that with me? That it, if you want uh, 2 plus 2 to be 5, then it's 5. If you want it to be eight, it's eight because, listen, there is no truth. No objective truth. Now, how many, how many others have heard things like that, right? There is no objective truth. That means it's true regardless. Well, in the Christian worldview, there has to be objective truth, right? Because... 
God has said something and it's either true or untrue. I mean, we have we have reality on this side, right? And we have fables and wishful thinking on the other side. And I'm not saying that just to be kind of we're at church and so you expect that. If you reason it out yourself, you have to come to the same conclusion. Truth comes from God. Untruth would come from something that has just been made up by the mind of men, right? It's interesting, sometimes when you start talking to people about this, they say, well, there is no absolute truth. Right? That's what they'll say. And then you, then you have to ask the next question, right? Well, is that an absolutely true statement that you just made? Right? Is that true? Well, I can't say it's an absolutely true statement. So there is absolute truth. No. <laughs> And it becomes a silly, a silly form of discussing anything, right? When you state something is true and then you immediately have to retract that truth because it contradicts your own statement, then you, want, you, then you start to understand why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you really want truth and knowledge, it all begins with the one who made us all. Doesn't that make sense? Amen. So, it's obvious then that truth comes from somewhere, right? Think about morality. Corey was talking to me just the other day at the house and he said, Dad, he said, I don't understand that. Because when people get involved in sin and they do wrong, he said, it just messes up their life. It brings a lot of heartache and pain and just trouble and problems. And he said it's so much better to live the right way where you can avoid all these heartaches, problems, and troubles. Amen. I said, son, that's, that's biblical. That's common sense. That's the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of knowledge, right? Amen. But fools despise and hate instruction. For instance, a lot of times when they look at the Bible, they are outraged by the immoral things they see in the Bible. Have you ever seen someone who is an atheist or an evolution say that? They said, you believe in the Bible? And in the Bible, babies were killed and, and some were boiled and eaten and, and they can think of all the worst events in the Bible and say, and you believe that? Well, first of all, where do you get your morality from? If you're just, and, and listen, I'm not saying this in a kind of a rude way, but if you're just pawn scum, they, they, they say, how did life begin on this side? They say, well, it rained on rocks for millions of years and a primordial soup developed, and out of that primordial soup, uh, life began... Am I telling you the truth, basically, what their theory is? And so you say to them, well, wh how can you have, don't steal from our truth that says there is right and wrong, there is good and evil, there is right morals and wrong morals. Don't start criticizing God when you're building your life on a foundation that has absolutely no morality to it whatsoever. Right? You say, preacher, prove that. Well... They say on this side of the scale, it's the survival of the fittest. Right? And, and I don't know how many things were just devoured and destroyed and disappeared. And because they didn't, uh, according to them, evolve correctly, they were consumed. They died off. Genocide. The same ones that tell us that we are animals, Right? Are y'all still with me this morning? I'm talking about the fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge. The same ones that tell us that we were, we're animals, basically, we're just a part of the mammal community, right? Get really upset when the Bible says something about a child dying or something like that. But when they watch lions and, and the pride of lions, when a new lion comes in that pride, guess what's one of the first things he does? He goes around and kills all the male cubs all the cubs 
all of the cubs, not just the male cubs, because he wants the female lion to come back in so he can breed them. And when they look at that, they say, well, that's just nature. There's no really right or wrong to that. It's just nature. And then when they look at some stuff in the Bible, they say, how appalling is that? I can't believe that's true. So they justified on the one hand, right? Amen. And because it fits their atheistic thinking, they turn around and use that same tool against the truth. Right? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. So on the one hand, they say, oh, it's perfectly fine. And then on the other hand, if God was involved in it, they say how wicked and awful and immoral it is. And the same ones on this side are for the abortion of babies. Amen? Most of the time, that's their philosophy, right? But then if a child dies on this side, they say, why in the world would God allow that to happen? You mean you can kill babies and it's okay, but if the Creator says their time on the earth has come to an end, it's not okay. It's okay for you to do it, but for the one who made them not to do it? Isn't that insanity? So if you don't have a, a world view that's built on truth, absolute truth, true morality, what is right and what is wrong, you come to a silly conclusion about life. By the way, all false religions fit in that as well. You know what false religions are? They're religions that are made by man to allow them to do what they really want to do and just get God involved in it. You understand what I'm saying? If, if they were wanting to know the true and living God, there would be some things they could not do because God would say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. You can't be a fornicator. You can't live that way. Amen? And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where all knowledge really stems from. It stems from the truth that God is. And if you'll, if you'll accept that reality, then you'll end up your life being a wise man and not a foolish man. All wisdom is found in Christ. Listen to what Colossians chapter 2 and verse, 30, uh, verse 3 and 4 says. It said, in him, in whom, it's referring to Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The reason I point that out to you is what the next verse says. The next verse says, verse 4 of Colossians 2, and this I say, the reason I want you to know this, the reason I want you to know that in Him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, verse 4, this I say unto you, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words of man's wisdom. I want you to know true wisdom is found in Christ and the reason you need to know that is because there will be other people in the world that will entice you. It will sound interesting. Can I give you an example? Jehovah's Witnesses will try to convince you that there is no hell and how many of us really want there to be a hell? I mean, I'm not... Like, if I had a vote, I, you know, I know there has to be punishment for sin and I know God is just in that, Right? He's the one who has all wisdom. He knows what he's doing. But I don't know of anybody that would say, yeah, I'm in favor for prisons. You know? I wish there was never, never a need for a prison to be built. I certainly wish there was never a hell that was made. But just because we don't want it to be true doesn't make it not true. God is the one that shared with us in His Word that if you leave this world having rejected Christ living in your sins and you'll spend eternity separated from Him in His prison called hell where there's fire and torments and everlasting punishment, right? So just because we want it to be true, it's an enticing thing. It sounds good, but...
But that's not the knowledge that comes from the Creator. Paul warned young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babbling and opposition of science falsely so-called. So there's wisdom out there that men insist this is wisdom. If you, the world would say to you, if you really want wisdom and knowledge, you come and listen to us and we will train you, we will teach you, we will show you what real wisdom is, but the problem is at the end of it, their conclusions are all wrong and their wisdom is not wisdom at all, it's insanity. You say, preacher, why in the world would anybody do that? Why would anybody choose to believe a lie rather than the truth? Why would anybody try to convince themselves that there is no God? I mean, look, if there is a God that made us, right? Isn't that good news? Isn't that wonderful? That we have a Creator? especially a creator that loved us so much he gave his only begotten son, that is an amazing being, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful that we have a creator? You say, preacher, why is it that they fight so hard and hate so much and rebel against the truth that there is a God? They'll believe anything but that. Isn't that true? And there's so many examples of that. I don't want to bore you this morning about it. But they, they will believe anything but... Well, the Bible tells us why. It's in Romans chapter number 1. And I would like, if you have, your, have the Scriptures in front of you, turn there. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 17. For therein is righteousness, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, that is, is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, listen to this, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's a, that's a powerful little phrase. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What they, what they do is on purpose they suppress the truth. They don't want to acknowledge the truth. They don't want to accept the truth. They know the truth. They just don't want to respond to that truth. Isn't that what that verse is saying? They hold. So they have the truth. They know the truth. But they are, they are hiding that truth in unrighteousness. And you say, preacher, why would anybody do that verse Number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Let me say something to you, and you may disagree with this, but this is true. There are no real atheists. There are no real atheists. And the reason I say that is based on this passage of Scripture, in their heart of hearts, they know there is something there. They know someone is there. They know something sounds right about that. Something rings true about that. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Listen to verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead so, they, so that they are without excuse. When you go outside and you look up and you see the sun, moon, and stars and you see the earth that God has made, it testifies that there is a creator. You can't escape that. Now, if you want to try to convince yourself that this is a big accident, a cosmic accident, and we all ended up here, you've got some really hard questions that you need to answer. Right? How did something come from nothing? You say, well, that's a scientific impossibility. How many would agree with that? If you've got nothing, 
Guess what? Ten billion years from now, nothing's still going to be nothing. Amen? Amen? If you want to believe that theory, you have to convince yourself that nothing is something. Did you hear what I said? Now, the reason I said that, there's supposed to be a really brilliant man who wrote a book that declared nothing is really something. An entire book. Trying to convince you. Now, now you would kind of almost chuckle at that, right? Yeah. Nothing, is, nothing is really something? How confused do you have to be to believe that nothing is something? Nothing can only be nothing. <laughs> so you have to believe that all this came from nothing. Now listen, to me, to me, to me, that is willful ignorance. You can't look at the design of this universe. Let me just, one thing, I'll do this in closing. You know, we hear a lot about DNA, right? Because it helps us find who has committed crimes. I think they found the wicked bomber by a fingerprint. But DNA as well, right? They found him quickly because of DNA. Well, what is DNA? It's not just blood. It's information. It is... Well, it comes from a, a lot of... You can get out of the hair or, or saliva or from blood, but it's... it's, it's uh, some of the wisest men have described it as our computer code. So your DNA, when you're born, you receive it from your parents, and when you're born, it tells, all the information is there that tells you what color hair you're going to have, what color eyes you're going to have, how, how tall you are going to be or not tall. All that information is in there. How to make your heart, your liver, how to, how to, how to develop you, everything is found. All Now listen, I beg you, you study this out, and you'll see that there's a lot of information about that, of how much... How much, how much knowledge is in our DNA? In other words, if you were to take this book, right? Now, when you look at the book, you have to say there's a lot of words and sentences and commas and periods, and, and there's no way that this should just uh, fall into place. Somebody had to design this and order it, right? Well, guess what? Your DNA is filled with so much more information than you can find in the pages of this book, the Bible. And so the next question is, where did that information come from? Right? And some people say, well, it came through the evolutionary process. Well, but the problem is this. You can't add information. The information, you can take away from information, right? But how is information added you, you can't add accidental information. Are y'all with me? That information has to be there already. That information came from someone. So one of the scientists, uh, one of the atheists of our day was asked that question and said, where did all this information come from? And this was his wise response. Well, the, the theory that we're looking at now is that it's come from aliens from another planet. They came here and they seeded that information in the DNA, and that's where all the information comes from. Uh, by the way, you, you chuckle, but that's Charles Daw uh, 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 Dawkins that said that. Not not Charles Darwin, but Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, thank you. He's the one that said that. Now listen, that, that's why I say they suppress the truth and knowledge. They would believe anything, anything, that they would believe that you can you can have a pond scum and life come out of that rather than God in the beginning God said let there be light. They believe anything. They believe that even aliens from some planet that we don't even know about would come here and put in the pond scum DNA information. And that's where the information come from. Anything but God. Why? Because they don't want to live under His authority and His rule. 
And they close their eyes to truth. And listen, when you get to the end of the day, when you hear their stories and their reasoning, you say, that is laughable. It's insanity. I'll close with this, I promise you. We went to hear a, a debate at one of the colleges here in town. And the guy that was debating two atheists college professors at the college here in Jacksonville said over and over again, so you believe that life came from rocks, right? And they kept avoiding that. They didn't want to say, yes, we believe that life come from rocks because they realized how insane that sounds. You say, we, we say God created the world. That makes sense, Right? But finally, the debater pinned them down. And in frustration, one of the professors said, yes, life came from rocks. And the crowd that was there chuckled. Because brilliant men have made themselves foolish because they just don't want to know the truth. This is the joy of this passage. That means that you can grow in real knowledge and understanding. If you just start with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Amen? I get all knowledge from Him. I could, I, everything that's in the world, every, math, language, everything can be traced back to the one who made it. Amen? And so it all starts with God and a right reverence and fear for Him. Amen? So if you don't know him, the need of this hour is to come and say, Lord, I would be insane to reject your son after you've given us such a clear revelation of what salvation is. Amen. And if you're not growing in your relationship with the Lord, today would be a good day to come and say, Lord, I need to get closer to you. Amen. I don't need all the information this world has. That just clogs up my brain. I need real knowledge, real wisdom, and I need